Welcome back to the channel. My new Substack post is out now. It's about a new movement that's going around. Now, it's not the majority of people. No, no. It's not the majority that believe in this. It's a tiny, tiny minority. But they're concentrated in the journalism class and they're concentrated on social media. So it's worth responding to. The title of my post is, I'm going to mask because I want fewer coals and other flawed ideas. And it's about a new idea, which is that even though the worst of COVID, the emergency phase is behind us, I will choose to mask, I will choose to ventilate and even hyperventilate buildings and shared spaces, cancel gatherings at a drop of a hat, maybe even test relentlessly in the winters to avoid getting common URIs, the common cold, flu-like symptoms. I don't like that. I want to get less of that. So I'm going to do all these things going forward. We'll call it the new normal. And there's a lot of people that adhere to this view. They believe that with these simple steps, we'll be able to reduce the instance of the annual cold, and we'll all be better off as a result, or at least they'll be better off as a result. To me, this view suffers from three types of arrogance, and I wanted to describe that in my essay, the three different types of arrogance that this view suffers from. So let's go through that. Number one, they're arrogantly assumed that it works. I mean, these people are assuming something that has yet to be proven, that these interventions actually do lower the rate year over year of cold and flu. Now, of course, the COVID-19 years was, was an abnormal event because not only did we do all these things, we severely disrupted the flow of people across societies. We severely disrupted children's education. We did so many things. And there was a new virus that was out there outcompeting some of the other viruses potentially. Now, that will be different going forward. And we don't have any credible studies that show that wearing a thin surgical mask perhaps even incorrectly worn, a KF94, perhaps with loosening earlobe straps, actually does work to prevent you from getting the cold and flu-like symptoms year over year. We just don't know. And it's very likely that everybody will eventually fatigue and have non-compliance because it turns out you can't mask when you're eating and drinking. You can't mask all the time. Even the most ardent mask proponents are out there pointing out that they occasionally don't mask. There was somebody who recently said that when they take a selfie photo, they decide to hold their breath and lower the mask so they can get their face in the photo. Well, that's a type of magical thinking that if you hold your breath, that you're not going to get COVID-19. And I wonder if people will actually be able to hold their breath. Is this person going to be able to hold their breath for 10 minutes? 15 minutes, depending on if it takes a while to set things up, depending on if there's a problem with the photo. Are they David Blaine? Or is this person secretly going to take a breath at 15 seconds like most people would, maybe even unbeknownst to themselves? And the truth is, there are so many threads that go out there, even though I did everything right, I still got COVID-19. And even though I did everything right, I'm still going to get seasonal cold and flu. Because the truth is that human beings will lapse. It's inherent for who we are. That's the other piece of the puzzle that doesn't get discussed quite enough. Why do respiratory viruses even exist? Respiratory viruses exist because they take advantage of a niche created by human beings. And that niche is to be human means to be close. All the great moments in life happen when you're breathing the same air as someone else. Those are all the most intimate and also most important moments. And that's where the virus takes advantage of. It takes advantage of who we are as people. So to really deny it the opportunity to spread means to deny ourselves what it means to be human. And so I think it's unlikely to be the case that they'll be able to sustain it. I think they're arrogant to assume that it will actually work year over year over year over year. I think the effect size will diminish to the point where it probably goes to zero. I don't know that that'd be true. In fact, no one will ever know because no one is running actually well done controlled studies to evaluate this. The second type of arrogance it suffers from. It's the arrogance that they're not really even looking out the window. They don't know where America is. 99% of America is 100% back to normal. They're not masking. They're going to concerts, bars, and restaurants. They are doing things like it's 2017. They seem completely oblivious to, and they're over the COVID-19 virus, and many of them are literally over it. They've just had and recovered from it, and so it's time to get back to normal life. This small fraction of people who stubbornly cling to the idea that we can have a new normal don't recognize that they will be very isolated in this new normal. Most people won't be with them. Now, of course, they're enriched in their pockets. They tend to be higher socioeconomic status. They tend to be white-collar workers who can zoom in most gatherings. They tend to be people who 
have not had to interact too much with the outside world, people who even pre-pandemic may have suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorder, but the pandemic has finally vindicated, at least in their own minds, some of those views. And these people are very vocal. They have, I think, a stranglehold on mainstream journal journalism. Journalists are enriched with these type of folks who think that we should move in this way, but they are oblivious to where most Americans are. You travel to most cities in this country and people are not doing this and they won't be doing this. I saw one of these people say that we know masking works after all, trust the physics. Well, that's a type of uh, ignorance, which is that understanding the physical properties of a barrier over your nose and mouth, it's not the same thing as understanding the policy implications of having a mask policy or encouraging people to mask season over season. Policy depends on, yes, the physical properties, but also so much more, compliance, behavior, fatigue, the waning effect size. Policy has to incorporate unintended consequences, spillover effects. Policy is its own game. It's the emergent complexity. You can't understand physics and know that, quote, masks works. That's so ignorant. Ignorant, uh, by that logic, you could understand cell biology and know that drugs work, but we can't. That's why we run human trials before we approve drugs. See, they, they're oblivious to so much. They're living in a bubble of wishful thinking, magical thinking. If I do this year over year, I'll get fewer colds and flu. And the third type of arrogance, which I think is actually the most important arrogance, is that they have assumed this is actually in their best interest. They don't know that to be the case. Now, of course, it's indisputable. Nobody feels good when they have a cold or flu. And all things being equal, I would love to feel the way I feel when I feel healthy all the time. That's indisputable. But what is the real impact of significantly lowering the number of cold and flu-like episodes over a lifetime? What might that do to the body? And we can't just focus myopically on cold and flu. We have to think about the body as a complex system of which we have barely scratched the surface of immunity over the life course. We barely understand our knowledge is quite primitive. So if you take somebody and you reduce the number of cold and flu-like diseases they get over the course of 20 years from something like, you know, 18 and bring it down to 12, which might be what these, what these draconian uh, self-restrictions accomplish, but maybe these people believe they'll actually get it down to zero. If they do, they're, you know, they're still in the magical thinking bu bubble. But let's just assume it goes from 18 to 12 or maybe even 18 to zero. Is that really in your long-term best interest? What does that do for immunity, for autoimmunity? What does that do for the eventual breakthrough infection? Are you going to be sicker when you get it? What does it do to autoimmune diseases, to cancer? What does it do to the totality of your body? Are you really better off when you're 80 by avoiding something that has been happening since the dawn of humanity, something that is intertwined with who we are, something that is inherently natural to living life, which is getting cold and flu, are you really better off? They have no clue if that's true or not. I'm not saying it is true. I'm not saying it isn't true. I also don't know, but at least I have the humility to know I don't know. And I wouldn't pursue something with a fanatical zeal that it will make me better off when the truth is I have total ignorance about whether or not I'll be better off. So these are the three types of arrogance they suffer from. The arrogance that what they're doing actually works. They don't know that to be true, particularly with their own waning compliance, particularly as they read their own stories from people in their own tribe who say, even though I did everything right, I still got COVID-19. They're turning on each other like a circular firing squad. There's always a photo of an ardent, you know, mask forever person on Twitter who's caught eating at a restaurant unmasked, making justifications and arguments why well, it's okay for me, but those toddlers still need to do it. And then they, they shoot that person or metaphorically, and that person is deleting their social media account. They're, they're, they're dwindling in numbers and they're arrogant to think they'll be able to stave off certainly COVID-19, but also other cold and flus. There's another type of arrogance. The second arrogance is the arrogance to assume that other people will do this too. And that arrogance would be shattered by opening the door, going out, traveling, visiting other places in this country, outside these certain pockets and enclaves and communities where these kinds of beliefs are running rampant, which tend to be upper middle class, highly educated, work from home communities um, that are intertwined with uh, universities and, and journalism. That's where I see them as enriched. And then the third type of arrogance, the deep arrogance, they think they understand the immune system so perfectly well that they know it's actually in our own best interest to do this year over year. And the truth is they don't do that. So these are the three types of arrogances. And if you like this, I encourage you to read the essay. It's on Substack. I'm going to mask because I want to get fewer coals and other flawed ideas. It's on my Substack. And there's another Substack I've got to plug today. Dr. Katie Scharf from Oregon. 
She's a practicing infectious disease doctor, and she's got a brilliant essay out on sensible medicine right now, this morning, and it talks about the personal side of COVID-19. What was it like to be an ID doctor? And some of the experiences she's had around her children, who one recently went to school without COVID-19 and did a little bit of a cough, and the stigma this child experienced. And I think it's really important that we discuss it. We are creating a culture of excessive fear of something that is inevitable and natural, which is getting sick from time to time with colds and flu. That's part of life. When you entered life, that's what you're getting into and you're not gonna avoid it for the rest of your life, no matter what you do, unless you seal yourself in your bunker under your house. And even the most ardent proponents of this kind of new normal strategy, they completely miss that they themselves are unlikely to sustain it. And proof of that is they're dwindling numbers with their tweet thread after tweet thread of how one after the other inevitably gets the more and more contagious COVID-19 variant. And it's going to keep happening. And then eventually they're going to also get sick with colds and flus because that's what it means to live life. And to me, but the deepest arrogance is the arrogance to assume that if you were to avoid it, that would actually be in your best interest. They have no such, no, no idea, no clue. They're just talking. And they're often very deeply ill-equipped to be talking about things like that. So if you like this, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Forward this video to a friend or colleague. Encourage them to watch this channel. And subscribe to my Substack, Vinay Prasad's Observations and Thoughts. Subscribe to Sensible Medicine. I got two podcasts that you might be interested in. One is Plenary Session, which is a podcast of uh, medicine, oncology, health policy that I run. And it tends to be wonky, academic. I run another podcast with my friend and colleague Zubin Damani. It's called VPZD Show. And it tends to be more irreverent and more about general medical issues. So subscribe to those two podcasts and uh, I'll be back for more videos. I've got some stuff coming up on Malignant, the book. I've got some stuff coming up about bad oncology trials. And I also got some stuff coming up about health policy and COVID-19 and FDA, which I think you'll be interested in. So until next time.